Uh, well, it is a great joy to welcome Layla Ishik back to MIT. Layla got her PhD here working with Tommy Pojo uh, and then stayed on for a postdoc working with me and Gabrielle, lucky us. Um, and then she went and took a faculty position at Hopkins in 2019. Uh, and Layla combines three skills not usually found in the same person. She has major computational chops, as you will see. She can build and test all kinds of computational models. Uh, second, she has a deep interest in cognition and not just basic aspects of perception, but really high-level perceptual cognitive phenomena. Uh, and third, she knows how to get really good data and do damn good experiments. Uh, and that's quite a powerful combo. So she has applied this combo to uh, try to understand social perception, which is a really important problem. Uh, social perception is not just a matter of, say, recognizing a face, something uh, any old CNN can do, uh, but the much harder problem of understanding social structures, interactions between people, how those people feel about each other, what they might be doing, uh, what the nature of their interaction is, et cetera. And so in her uh, postdoc work, she, uh, along with Cami Coldwin, um, found a part of the cortex that responds very selectively when people are looking at two people interacting with each other as opposed to two people doing their own separate thing. And that's pretty, uh, a pretty amazing high level specific function, a pretty cool thing. Uh, and so she has been uh, studying this region further and coming up with computational models uh, of how, uh, how we perceive social interactions. Uh, and as I mentioned, that's beyond your garden variety CNN. And so Layla's devising uh, some very interesting structured uh, graph models of social perception, and we'll hear about that today. Thank you, Layla. Thank you, Nancy, for the kind introduction, and thank you, everyone, for having me. It's been like, such a, an amazing treat to be back. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about the neural computations underlying human social interaction recognition. All right, so many of you have probably seen this image. I think I stole the example from Gabrielle, actually. But even if you haven't, you can probably quickly understand what's happening and why it's funny. And in order to do that, you need to not only be able to recognize objects, people, scene information, um, but you need pretty rich knowledge of the physical world, like the fact that when you step on a scale, it reads as heavier. Um, and I think even more importantly, also the social world, right? So you need to know that this guy on the scale doesn't know that Obama's foot's on it but everyone else does, and they're all laughing about it together. And one of the, this motivates the main question we try to answer in our lab, which is how do humans extract all of this rich social information from visual input? And this is a really hard problem, right? So even just this image alone had multiple entire think pieces written about it, right? So you can compare the rich descriptions that humans give to this image to what um, Google's state-of-the-art deep neural network would say about it. All right, so um, pretty amazingly, compared to even just a few years ago, Google's system can um, accurately put a bounding box around almost every object in the image and accurately tell you what each one is. All right? Um, but in contrast, there's been far less of an attempt to try to understand the social information in scenes. There have been some attempts to do this, but they've been very limited. And, um, Google's attempt at this is to try to recognize faces and classify the emotional expression of those faces. All right, so again, does a pretty amazing job at recognizing every single face, no small feet. Um, and now you can zoom in face by face and get its um, emotion prediction for each face. All right, so let's start with this guy, which the, is face number 10. And it tries to make a prediction about possible emotional expressions, joy, sorrow, anger, surprise. But it rates everyone as equally very unlikely. We can also look at Obama's face. And again, every expression is equally very unlikely. And in fact, the only confident classification the system makes is about this face back here, which is very likely blurred. <laughs> um, and I think this really highlights the huge gap between all the progress we've made in understanding visual object recognition and humans' rich visual social abilities. So the approach we try to take in our lab is to apply the methods that have been successful in helping us understand object recognition to understand social vision. And so in particular, we use a combination of high spatial neuroimaging and high temporal resolution imaging, behavior computational models, 
and the combination and comparison of all three types of data. And so today what I'm going to talk to you about is um, the application in particular of fMRI, uh, a series of studies using fMRI data, um, and then tell you about a computational model they motivated that we then used to try to reproduce human behavior. And the focus of today's talk and much of our work is on understanding and recognizing other people's social interactions. And so by this, I mean third-party social interaction. So how you recognize, for example, the interaction between Obama and his staffer, not your own interactions with somebody else. This is a hugely important um, ability for humans. So after only a few months of age, infants can tell if one uh, puppet, if they're interacting, and if one is helping the other one or hindering it. Primates can also make similar um, distinctions by observing other people's interactions. But until recently, very little was known about the neural basis or neural computations. And so I'm going to tell you about these two things today. And so starting with the um, neural basis, um, we knew from decades of social neuroscience research that there are many br uh, brain regions involved in various aspects of person perception, like recognizing faces, bodies, motions of individual people, and also theory of mind, um, understanding the mental states of other people. And so in a first um, series of studies with Nancy, Cami, and others, we wanted to ask if recognizing social interactions relied on one of these other known brain regions or something else. And so the real world um, interactions that I started with um, are imbued with all sorts of rich contextual visual knowledge. And to, so to start with, we wanted to kind of strip that away to you know, a social interactions bare components. Um, so we uh, showed subjects these point light videos that contain videos of two agents acting with some sort of contingency, social contingency. So they look something like this. And we compared these interacting uh, pairs of point lights with pairs of point light figures engaged in two independent actions. And so in a first fMRI experiment, we showed people in the scanner a bunch of videos like the one on the top and contrasted it to a bunch of videos like the one that's on the bottom. Um, and we asked in uh, just a first uh, step in a standard group um, analysis if there are any regions that respond reliably more to the interacting versus independent videos. And this is what we find, a region that um, is pretty uh, localized just to the right hemisphere to the posterior STS, um, shown here, I've circled it. And so this is the result, this is um, a group analysis where um, looking at the results across all of our subjects. We can also localize this region in individual subjects. So here's one subject's brain. Um, and I, we identified this region that I'm showing in red that seems to respond more to the interaction than independent actions. And we asked, to what extent, if at all, does it overlap with the other known nearby social processing and motion processing regions in and around the STS um, for other people's mental states, in particular the RTPJ, faces in the PSTS, and motion. And as you can see in this subject, while these regions are all nearby, their peaks of activation are, are anatomically separate. That's just one subject. Here are three more subjects. And so you can see that there's some intersubject variability. But for the most part, these regions all fall in pretty stereotyped locations um, and are anatomically separate. In follow-up experiments that I won't get into, we also show that they have very different functional profiles. So the social interaction region responds a lot to social interactions, but not really to mental state inference, faces, motion, et cetera. So in a second experiment, we wanted to see, one, does this uh, re responses in this region generalize to new stimuli? And two, can they tell you something about the type of interaction that's going on? So much like that um, early Kylie Hamlin study I showed you in infants, we designed these stimuli where one agent was trying to achieve a goal, and the second agent either helped it Yay. Or uh, hindered it. Oh, oops. Sorry, now you have to watch these both at once. And we contrasted these with kind of physical interactions that were just shapes moving around, inanimate shapes like billiard balls. Um, and we found that um, not only did responses in this region generalize to the second set of stimuli, so it responded significantly more to the interacting, uh, to the social versus physical interactions, but the pattern of activity in this region could also decode helping versus hindering interactions. 
Um, so we found this region that um, is in the PSTS that seems to be selective for other people's, recognizing other people's social interactions, that distinguishes between helping and hindering interactions, um, and is functionally distinct for nearby regions for faces, animacy, motion, theory of mind, et cetera. And so while it was pretty exciting that it generalized across these two very wildly different sets of simple stimuli, um, and while these two sets of stimuli look very different from each other, they're still both um, a far cry from the real world. Um, so the real world example that I started with is much more complex, rich, has a lot of contextual information, et cetera. Um, and actually, in fact, the real world is even worse than this because often you're not viewing static images, you're looking at temporally extended events, right? Um, and so here is a, um, here's a clip from the um, BBC television series Sherlock that we used in a second study that I'll talk about. John, John Watson. Stamford, Mike Stamford, we were bots together. Yes, sorry, yes, Mike, hello. Hi. All right, so there's a lot going on visually. There's speech and language, and it's also kind of ambiguous what's happening, right? Um, and so we wanted to know to what extent our findings that we saw with these very clear-cut controlled stimuli would extend to more real-world settings. And in particular, when you're watching this, like I said, there's not only their social interaction, but you're also seeing faces and hearing voices, um, probably trying to understand something about their mental states and also processing their language, right? And so um, many people have rightly criticized that if we just study each of these cognitive functions in isolation, it's gonna be hard to understand whether and how they uh, each are processed in the real world. And indeed, one prior study with movies suggested um, that social interactions are processed in theory of mind regions rather than the PSTS, suggesting that these two things may not be separable in more real-world settings. However, no prior studies with movies have really tried to tease apart these different factors, so that's something we really wanted to get at in this work. Um, so in this study led by my former postdoc, Hamie Lee Masson, uh, we sought to ask just this. Can we find a similar type of selective response for social interactions during a full-length movie? Um, and so to do this, we used two publicly available movie data sets. So one uh, collected by Janice Chen and colleagues, where 17 adults watched the first episode of the BBC show Sherlock. And a second uh, collected by Aliko and colleagues, where subjects watched the um, romantic movie 500 Days of Summer. So these are two different data sets collected by different labs on different continents of different movie genres. And so we really tried to see if we could find um, phenomena that would generalize across these two very different sets. And in order to, I think it's really important to do sort of more content-based analyses on these movies. So to do this, we um, really densely label each of the movies with um, a combination of perceptual and also social affective features. So we automatically extracted several visual features like the pixel value, motion energy. Um, we labeled whether the scene was taking place indoor or outdoor faces or written words on the screen, and then as sort of like a high-level visual catch-all, the output of the fifth convolutional layer of uh, AlexNet deep neural network. We also extracted some uh, basic auditory features, the pitch and amplitude, uh, and had annotators label whether there is background music playing. Uh, for social features, we had uh, annotators label whether a social interaction was taking place on the screen, whether a character was speaking, whether a character was engaged in theory of mind, and I can talk a little bit about how we define this later if people are interested, and then affective features, um, the average valence and arousal of each scene. And so just to give you an idea of what these look like, in that scene you just saw, this would be labeled as a social interaction with character speaking, a neutral scene, there would be the DNN features, the output of a face detection algorithm, pitch, motion energy, et cetera. And so, all of these things are really tightly correlated. So that's one thing I want to stress to you that, you know, to keep in mind. And so to understand each of these features contributions to brain activity, we um, learned an encoding model that tried to link the activity in each voxel over the course of the movie um, to the feature representations over the course of the movie. And we just learned a linear mapping between these two. 
uh, using a type of regression called banded ridge regression that uh, you know, helps deal with correlated feature spaces, but also helps to account for the fact that some of our features, like the output of the deep neural network, are really high dimensional and others are unit dimensional. And so we can train um, the classifier on one subset of the movie or the encoding model on one subset of the movie, and then make a prediction on held out movie data about um, what the voxel activity should be. And we're just using as our uh, accuracy metric the correlation between the true and uh, predicted voxel activity. All right, so as a first pass, we just wanted to look at how well the model did over the course of the movie. Um, and so subjects only saw the movie once. We have no measure of reliability within subject, but just to try and remove noisy voxels, we um, restricted our analysis to voxels that had significantly above chance correlation across subjects. So um, I'm graying out other voxels. And what you see is that every, um, what we found is that for every voxel within our um, ISC mask, we could, our encoding model predicted significantly above chance um, the, the activity in that voxel. An activity peaked um, in the left, but it was quite strong at both bilaterally along the STS. All right, so now that we have this, we can try to understand um, how the different features are linked to voxel activity. And like I mentioned, um, the features are all extremely correlated. So for example, whether there's a social interaction and whether there's a character speaking have like a R value of like 0.8 or above 0.8 or something like that, right? So it seemed kind of hopeless, but we thought we would try. So the first thing we did was just try to see if we could even separate out the contribution of social and perceptual features because for example, all sorts of things like the um, lighting on screen correlate with affective features, et cetera. And so to do this, we built three encoding models. The full model that I told you about, a model based on just the perceptual features, and then a third model based on just the social features. Um, and then we can calculate the unique variance explained in each voxel by the perceptual features by taking the um, variance explained in the full model and subtracting the social variance explained, for example, and vice versa for unique social variance. We can also use this approach to look at the unique variance explained by each single feature in our data set. So we're particularly interested in social interactions. So we can compare the full model to a model trained with every other feature except a social interaction. And that difference should give us the unique variance explained by social interaction while accounting for all of our other features. All right. So as a first step and you know, sort of sanity check, we ask what is the unique variance explained by the perceptual features in the movie? And here are the results. Um, and so you see significant um, activity in auditory cortex, which seems reassuring, and also a bunch of visual regions. So that's a nice sanity check, right? Now we can do the same thing for the social affective features. And to be honest, I wouldn't have been surprised if this was like nothing, right? Because it's, it's a Hollywood movie. It's not designed as a stimulus set. But actually what you see is quite sensible. So you see um, high prediction or high variance explained along the STS in theory of mind regions and sort of in frontal action observation regions as well. And so even just this was pretty exciting that we could separate the contributions of perceptual versus social features in the movie. Um, and so now we wanted to see if we could separate out the contribution from social interactions versus theory of mind, because like I mentioned, some prior work had suggested that in natural settings, those two things are co-processed. And so here's the unique variance explained by social interactions. Oh, I didn't mention this. I'm only showing the, you the results for one movie, but they're very similar in the second movie as well. Um, and so what you see is that the most robust activity occurs um, bilaterally, in this case, along the STS. You can contrast that with theory of mind. And here the activity is, is weaker, and I think there's a lot of reasons why that might be, but you still do see unique variants explained in uh, TPJ, MPFC, Precunius, and other regions that you might expect based on the theory of mind network. And importantly, these two things, these two activations are largely non-overlapping. And so, I think this sort of content-based movie analysis is really promising, and we're extending it to other applications as well. Um, and so in the same Sherlock data, um, they had participants uh, recall the movie and we're using this approach to look at social interaction memories. We've also applied it to action recognition more broadly. And I think um, 
content-based movie analyses open up the doors to many other uh, difficult to scan populations. So um, using some awesome publicly available uh, data from Hillary Richardson and Rebecca Sachs, we're starting to look at kids watching a movie and how they might code, uh, how social interaction representations develop over time. And in an ongoing project, we're also showing the same movie to young adults with and without autism. Um, but to sum up the first part of the talk, what we found is that social interactions are selectively processed in the PSTS. And this seems to be true even in natural stimuli where they co-occur with so many other things. And so in the second half of my talk, I want to talk about the, discuss the computational implications of this work, or in other words, like, why should we care about neural selectivity? What can neural selectivity tell us about neural computations? One thing that we've seen now across many studies is that perceiving or recognizing social interactions is dissociable from theory of mind. So certainly those two things are tightly coupled, but when you watch an interaction, that doesn't seem to rely on the theory of mind network. And that um, adds to a bunch of other growing evidence that perhaps the computations being carried out by this region or being carried out when people recognize social interaction are visual in nature. So for example, there's been um, a lot of behavioral work showing that um, people process facing bodies like this on the left um, in a way that's subject to a lot of behavioral signatures of visual processing. Like they um, have advantages for, find, for being found in a visual search task, they suffer inversion effects, et cetera. And that's not true uh, when you have the bodies go back to back, and it's not true of other types of objects like chairs, for example. Um, but one puzzle has been that standard uh, either static convolutional deep neural networks or recurrent neural networks that are largely based on visual input and carry out visual computations seem to do a pretty bad job of recognizing interactions in both images and videos. And that's been used as evidence that um, perhaps the processes used to help you recognize different types of social interactions are not visual. And I mean, although they are from visual input, they require um, some sort of high-level reasoning or an explicit model of the social and physical world to understand what's going on. And so these are often, um, so just to make this concrete, going back to these um, stimuli that are often used by, for example, Ky Kylie Hamlin, um, where you have one triangle, you know, you, when you watch this video, um, these theories are often, and the best performing models of um, that reproduce human judgments are these generative inverse planning models, where, which would suggest that, for example, they work, I feel kind of silly explaining that to some people in this room, but they, you, um, they would work by extracting the agents and then generating hypotheses about what those agents might be doing. Um, so for example, you might hypothesize that the red circle is trying to go up the hill and the yellow triangle is trying to help, or that the red circle is trying to go up the hill and the yellow triangle is trying to hinder. And then based on these hypotheses, you could simulate possible trajectories. And importantly, both the hypothesis generation and the trajectory simulation are built on explicit world knowledge about goals, the physics of the world, et cetera. Um, and then the uh, model makes a selection by comparing all the uh, possible trajectories in the hypothesis space to the observed trajectory and making a pr that prediction that way. So for example, hint help would be the closest match here. And this is very different than the way um, sort of standard bottom-up neural networks work, where you know you take the agent information, you put them through some sort of end-to-end -end learning algorithm, and you make a prediction for helping. Um, but importantly, the, these models on the bottom tend to not work so well, right? Um, but there's a second insight that we got from the neuroimaging data that uh, social interactions are also dissociable from other types of um, visual processing, like faces, motion, et cetera, which suggests that perhaps they rely on some sort of specialized representations that um, are specific to social interactions. And in particular, one key property of interactions is that they're relational, right? You're always trying to recognize the interaction between two agents. And so we wanted to ask if purely information and computations would in fact be sufficient for matching human judgments um, 
if you add in this relational information into your models in the form of an inductive bias. Um, and this is work um, that we just published as a preprint print led by um, Manasi Malik, a graduate student in my lab. All right, so what do I mean by a relational inductive bias? We put it here um, into our model in uh, graph structure. So, for example, going back to that uh, red circle climbing the hill and the yellow triangle helping it, in a standard neural network, you might um, take information about these two agents, like their visual properties, their speed, motion, et cetera, and feed them into your neural network to make a prediction, right? So you could train your neural network on a bunch of these scenarios and then test it on a new scenario. Um, but instead, what you could do is you could represent these two agents as two nodes in a graph. And then you could represent them not just in isolation, but also input and learn representation about the edges between them. And then you can do that for a simple graph like this, or you might have a more complex graph that has multiple agents and objects. And you put that whole graph structure and you learn representations on that graph, uh, on that graph form and then use that to make a prediction. And th those are called graph neural networks. And we combined this graph neural network with a recurrent neural network that took um, video input at each time step to make a prediction about social interactions. And we called it social GNN. Um, and so this, this was inspired by a whole host of other graph neural network work, uh, research that's been coming out. But, um, and so it's certainly not the first graph neural network even to try to make social predictions. But what's novel about this is that most of these prior networks have tried to make time step by time step trajectory predictions. And this is really the first network to try to make predictions about social events, um, social scenes based on temporally extended events. And so to test the network, we use this great um, data set from the Tenenbaum lab called Phase that uh, has a lot of these Hyder and Simmel style animations with two agents shown here in red and green uh, and two objects shown in pink and blue and different relationships between them. So here's one example. And so the agents both have a physical, um, each have a physical or social goal and you can define the relationship between them. And as you can see, they're really visually interesting as well. So do, what does this look like? Uh, so we can, for each video, you can uh, try to predict the interaction type. Did this, so did this look friendly, adversarial, or neutral to folks? Adver yeah. Ex <laughs> yeah, so this is an ex adversarial example. Um, and, um, the original um, data set had some human ratings on a subset of the videos, but we collected more on the entire uh, data set. So there were, um, like in the original paper, we told subjects that there are two creatures and two objects, and we gave them some information about the physical world, and we just asked them to judge the relationship. Okay, and so then we can try to um, replicate those human ratings in our models. And so the first thing to do for our graph model is to extract um, the graph at each time step. And so for each frame of the video, we have the node information for each agent and object. And so that's each agent's position, velocity, heading, direction, or angle, size, and whether it's an agent or object. And then we also code it in this graph where we add edges between any two entities that are touching. And they're undirected or bidirected edges. Okay, so in this frame that I'm showing you, the red agent is touching the blue ball, which is also touching the green agent. So that input graph would look like this. And importantly, while we um, use the uh, annotations from the data set, all of this information can be extracted pretty easily vi visually, right? And we feed it frame by frame into our graph neural network that I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about now. All right. So the, this is the basic structure. Um, so at each time step, um, there's an input, the input graph that I just showed you is put in and there's some graph computation that I'll tell you about in a second. And then time step by time step, the computation that's happening is essentially like a recurrent, pretty standard neuro, uh, recurrent neural network like an LSTM. And at the last stage, um, we make a prediction 
uh, that based, just based on a linear readout of the penultimate, of the final time step representation that predicts friendly, neutral, or adversarial. And so um, this input graph is put into the model by, like I said, taking each of the node representations, which are coded here as V, um, and pairing the send for every edge in the graph, pairing the uh, node information for the two nodes on either side of an edge. And so that information is put into um, a linear layer, which learns an updated edge representation, is then zero padded, and then put into the processing at each time step. And we compare this to two baseline models. The first is a pretty standard recurrent neural network that um, has the same LSTM uh, backbone as the graph neural network and takes all the same features that went into the graph neural network but just concatenates them. There's no structure here based on the edge, nodes and edges. And just like the graph neural network, it makes a um, prediction uh, based on the output of a linear classifier at the final time step. And then we also compared this to the inverse planning model um, uh, developed in the phase paper uh, known as simple. And so the first thing we, we can, um, what we did is we tried to predict the social interaction type, friendly versus neutral versus adversarial, so chances 33% for these three models. And humans agree on these videos. They're, they're pretty clear, like that one I showed you, but there is some ambiguity. So humans agree with each other about 80% of the time. All right, um, and so this is the performance of the inverse planning model. Um, there's some caveats to note about this, but I'll show you an example in a second where that one does much better. But the inverse planning model does much better than the visual RNN. Um, but on this subset, social GNN is at the level of human agreement. And again, this is a model that doesn't have any explicit representation about physics or agents goals. Um, However, so this is the caveat that the test set, the data set released also had this sort of challenging challenge generalization set where there were 100 videos that also had novel scenes and action types. So all of the results I just showed you on the original set were you know, trained and tested on held out data, but there was quite a bit of visual similarity across them. So here we're training the model on one set and then testing it on very different uh, visual and social scenes. And so here, um, the inverse planning model does quite a bit better, but social GNN still does significantly better than the matched visual model, um, and almost at the level of human agreement. Um, I think one thing that's interesting in some follow-up work we're looking at, the um, social GNN and inverse planning both explain unique variants in human behavior. So it's not just that social GNN is like inverse planning, but worse, there are several examples where um, social GNN agrees with humans and inverse planning doesn't. And so we're starting to try to explore, you know, I think this is a nice way to operationalize two different hypotheses and we're st starting to explore why some videos might be correctly classified by one model and not the other. Um, a real strength of this model though is that um, it can be image computable. So um, you can extend it to natural videos. So we use this um, gaze communication data set that again consisted of here between two and five agents interacting with each other in objects, and they're each labeled as having a different type of gaze communication event. And so the nice thing about the GNN is that um, you can extract graphs even from these, because it's somewhat abstracted away from the very low level visual information, you can extract graphs even from this. So here in this data set, we extracted um, graphs by um, putting bounding boxes around all the people and objects, um, and putting the, uh, uh, the, that node information through like a kind of standard deep neural network and using those as our node features. And we put coded edges in the graph based on the gaze direction of the people. So here the gaze direction, here the edges are directed. Um, and so this, in this frame, for example, the woman in pink is looking at the man in blue who's looking at the object. But now we went from a video again to the same type of graph that we can feed into the exact same network architecture. Um, and we can compare it to, so for this case, there are several different types of gaze communication, but um, the first thing we did was just look at videos with versus without an interaction. And so chance here is 50%. Um, and 
The visual RNN does slightly above chance, but actually it's not a balanced data set. So if you look at the confusion matrix, it's just totally guessing. And in contrast, our model does do quite a bit better. Um, and it also does a decent job at telling apart the different types of gaze interactions as well. And so what we found is that this purely visual model that does have relational inductive biases seems to be able to reproduce human interaction judgments. And importantly, it um, has no explicit representations of agents' goals or the physics of the world. Um, I think it's an interesting question to what extent it might be learning this information implicitly from training data. And this model, but a key to this model though is that you have to have this graph structure. So one thing we tried was can you just give the RNN um, information about what um, agents are touching each other, or looking at each other, and it doesn't perform any better. So there seems to be something important about this graph structure in particular um, to match, to reproduce human judgments. So we found that social interactions seem to be processed selectively in the human SES, and it's separate from a bunch of other functions that we know that are both perceptual, but also higher level. And it seems like structured visual computations may underlie um, the judgments human make, humans make about these um, videos. And in future work, um, uh, in collaboration with Tianmen and Josh, we're hoping to compare these uh, model representations across these different models to brain representations to, to kind of close the loop and see, in fact, are these, um, uh, these models that were inspired by our original neuroimaging findings, but also uh, other knowledge from cognitive science, you know, to what extent do they match the brain representations that we're seeing as well? Just want to circle back to this image and really stress, I think, the importance of trying to extend both our neuroimaging but also our modeling paradigms into more real-world settings. Um, and also acknowledge that, going back to that first example, it's all I've talked about today is pretty much like this interaction here between these people, right? But this alone is also not enough to tell that this, what's happening in this image, right? And so, Obviously, we are going to need that information about agents' mental states and the physical world, right? And so I think in reality, humans are incorporating all of this information, and we're going to have to start to figure out how the human brain might be doing that and try and understand how we might get models that can incorporate all of this rich, both perceptual and higher-level cognitive information together. Um, so I want to thank my lab, especially Hemi and Manasi, who led the work that I talked about today. Um, you can read more on our website. Um, both of the papers I talked about are available. Um, and I also want to thank everyone at CBMM, especially all my amazing former mentors, um, and Tianmin and Josh, who have been really great collaborators on this uh, GNN project. And I'm happy to take uh, any questions anyone has.